White Camp made carbon capture a top priority of her tenure in the United States Senate. She helped marshal an improbable coalition of 25 senators, 18 Democrats, six Republicans, and one independent. And together they passed uh, some of the most consequential energy and climate legislation in a generation. For many of us, if not most of us in this room, Senator Heitkamp was our champion. Uh, on a personal note, and, and, and she'll, she won't remember this, but I first met Heidi as a freshman in college. She was a young elected North Dakota tax commissioner, and uh, she was inspiring young people even then, myself included. Uh, she then became Attorney General in North Dakota, served two terms. Some of you rem may remember she was the lead negotiator of the AG's settlement on the, on the tobacco settlement. Um, on another personal note, Heidi and I also ran together on the same ticket in 2012 in North Dakota. I uh, remember my fondest experience was the last week of the campaign. I think it was 45 rallies in five days around North Dakota. And at probably a half dozen of those, we actually talked about carbon capture, enhanced oil recovery, and storage in cafes and town halls. And people love it. It was great. And uh, as you all know, she won against all odds in that cycle. It was probably arguably the greatest Senate race of that cycle. I didn't fare quite as well. Um, Senator Heitkamp entered the Senate as the only member of Congress sig with significant professional experience in carbon capture utilization and storage. She had served for years, I don't remember how many years, but on the board of Dakota Gasification. As many of you know, Dakota Gas is one of the largest examples of carbon capture in the world generally and from coal specifically. The credibility that she derived from that long-standing personal experience, plus her bipartisan instincts, quickly elevated her to a leadership role on this and related issues. Upon leaving the Senate, Senator Heitkamp is immediately engaged with the same energy and tenacity she demonstrated in the Senate. We are very fortunate that, that she is remaining in the arena and so engaged, and we're equally fortunate to have her here with us today. Thank you, Heidi. the question you've all been asking at lunch. Hang on, I brought up a little prop. What the heck is this? It's the Tetons, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't you proud of me? I figured that, I thought they couldn't have made Montana. I was trying to figure it out. Anyway, uh, now that we've got that straightened out, um, I <laughs> got myself all gummed up here. Um, I wanted to talk about um, kind of possibilities and, and why I continue to believe that even in a really, really incredibly polarized time, you can still get things done. And I would say, because my personal experience tells me that. So what is that personal experience? It's not just getting 45Q across the finish line, but it's also um, cutting a deal that I think is the second most important piece of climate legislation that happened in the last six years, and that is the opening up of the oil export, um, uh, stopping the oil export ban and opening up international markets for oil that's produced in the lower 48. Why is that important here? Because it's important if you're going to have a symbiotic relationship with the oil industry, that the oil industry, especially shale, which is one thing that Vicki doesn't talk enough about, how um, her company has pioneered and not only been huge in, in uh, carbon capture and sequestration for enhanced oil recovery, but she's doing it in shale, which um, heretofore had not been something that a lot of um, organizations were doing. Um, I came, as, as Brad said, out of the, the um, experience of Dakota Gas. Dakota Gas is a large uh, coal uh, gas uh, plant. Um, invented and dreamed up in the late 70s when everybody thought natural gas was um, on its way completely to extinction. And this was a way to fight the oil embargo. And um, lots of federal dollars went into that project. And lo and behold, the minute they deregulated natural gas, people found a way to find natural gas and the economics of the plant didn't go so well. So um, what had to happen, um, Basin Electric, who was heavily invested not from a dollar standpoint, but for putting up a whole electrical generation unit that was used to supply the gasification plant, 
had, a, had an acute financial interest, basically um, assumed the plant into its family, uh, included three outside directors, of which I was one of 12 years. But the more important part of this story is what happened before that, which is these innovators at Dakota Gas said, we've got to find a way to market byproducts um, from, the, from, the, um, uh, from the plant. And one of the byproducts they came up with was CO2. Pretty interesting, right? This was before there was any talk of actually getting credits, any talk of getting any kind of dividends under cap and trade. This was simply because CO2 was a marketable byproduct if we moved it up into the Weyburn field into Canada. And so uh, this relationship, long-term relationship, um, between the gas plant and the Weyburn field um, was created out of necessity of marketing byproducts out of the um, Dakota gasification plant. And it was an amazing exper experiment that resulted in a great deal of enhanced oil recovery, but also a great deal of profitability for Great Plains um, uh, coal gasification plant, but also for the Basin Electric family. Um, where they continue to struggle, and as you look at Boundary Dam, which is another carbon capture project at SAS Power, um, uh, competing for delivery of, of CO2 into that space, um, it, it, th the economics have changed somewhat for Basin Electric. But I, I, I'll tell you, um, one of the reasons why I got heavily involved in carbon capture early on in my tenure um, because I had seen it, and when people said it's vaporware, you guys remember that old uh, phase vaporware? If you ever managed a, a large um, computer development project, you'd know what that is when the consultant comes in and tells you everything that they're going to do for you by writing you a whole program, and you know it's vapor, it's not real, it doesn't exist. And I think a lot of people in this country believe that carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration is vapor. It's not real. And one of the things that conferences like this prove over and over again, it's real. It's real, it's being done every day in America. It's being done by innovators. There's huge amounts of investment headed in that direction. Not enough to get us to commercial scale on a lot of this effort. And so we need federal policies that promote and move this, um, this idea of carbon capture forward. So um, I'm not gonna talk to you about what. You got the what, right? It's right here. Um, you know, you don't need me to stand up here and give you per tons or uh, give you uh, uh, ideology on each one of these provisions, whether it's use it, whether it's transportation, whether it's infrastructure, whether it is um, flexibility on tax credits, it's all here. I am gonna talk about the why though, because the why is a critical piece of, um, of what you should be thinking about. You know, a lot of people come to this and a lot of people here come to this interested in carbon capture because you believe climate is an existential threat to the future of the planet and the future of our economy. So how many people here believe that you're here in this room because you care desperately, your number one priority is climate? About half the room. Okay, um, how many of you are here because you need to find a sustainable path forward for your industry with predictable um, outcomes that will help you make long-term planning in your industry possible. Good job. And how many of you here, because you think carbon is actually a resource and not a pollutant, and it, it could pre it poten uh, present an incredible potential for economic development and economic potential in this country. This, this series of discussion makes you unique in the climate space because you see opportunity not only in addressing climate concerns, and we all know, and you heard from the previous speaker, emissions control is not enough. That's an important thing to remember, and you know why I remember it? Because that's the only way I got Sheldon Whitehouse to be a co-sponsor of 45Q. Think about it. Do you think Sheldon really would have done any of that if he, did, if he didn't believe to his core that if we don't develop these technologies and deploy these technologies on a, on a, on a transformational basis, on a commercial basis, that we in fact would um, achieve climate goals. He's all in on the fight. He's all in on this resource. And that's a tribute to the coalition that's been put together, but the fact that Sheldon actually does his homework and understands the challenges of meeting um, climate targets by leaving other technologies behind, by being ideological 
in his approach to it. I don't think Sheldon thinks he can afford to be ideological and just go with one source and one discussion. And so we need, first off, to figure out how. How do we do this? Well, 45Q is a great example because I started out um, when I uh, uh, went to the United States Senate. Most of you know I have background in coal. North Dakota is a coal producing, actually it's lignite, as I say, BTUs with mud, mud and BTUs. Um, but, but, but it burns pretty good and it generates a lot of electricity in my state. And we have a coal research um, element, two cents of every ton goes into research. And we started very early on investing and deploying in new technologies that would advance the industry, not just stay in the kind of generation space that we had been in the past. And so when we started on 45Q and the National Mining Association would come in and say, we need your vote, I said, you know, you always got my vote. If you want my leadership, you can't be hell no. You've got to understand the challenges because let me tell you, because you didn't come to the table, you're done. And the only path forward for you in coal is to find a way to join the table, join the discussion about how we're going to move forward um, in a carbon constrained world. Now, there's very, very enlightened, there's very enlightened coal companies, Peabody, Arch, Cloud Peak. They all see it in the future. But I want, and this is going to be a political comment, that's not who has the ear of the president. There's people who honestly believe that all we have to do is elect people who, who um, uh, uh, will advance a, a pro-coal rhetoric, and that's going to solve the problem. How many new coal-fired power plants are on the mix? How many of you think in the next 10 years we're going to build a huge coal-fired power plant? How many of you know that coal-fired power in this country, if you look at generation, is, is about 40 years old? The last one that was built was built by Basin Electric at Dry Fork, large scale, not counting the one in, in Spirit Lake, which was built by Great River, which Great River's here too, right? Anyway, so, so there are some innovators, because that's an innovative plant, but it's not enough to get people to make investments. In fact, there was just an article yesterday about EEI saying, guess what? We're not doing it. So you can, you can talk all you want, but think about if we said we could do it with back-end carbon capture, give you that reliable, redundant source of energy. We at least then have a fighting chance. And so... Um, I, I always remind the natural gas industry, the same thing I told the industry, the coal industry 15 years ago. You are on a path of unsustainability unless you get in the mix. And so this issue, the natural gas industry has been very willing to engage in a discussion about what do we do with carbon capture if we're gonna continue to generate electricity with natural gas. Now the advantage they have is that we haven't found an alternative that provides the same level of redundancy and reliability. If you had told me in 1980 when I first started examining all this, and certainly um, beginning in 2000, that natural gas would be our primary source. You all remember natural gas prices, right? Riding the wave. up. It's $11, it's $2, it's $11. With the advent of fracking, We've stabilized that fuel source, and that fuel source now has become the major source of generation of electricity. But you saw today Rebecca's great presentation, thank you so much, um, for um, uh, showing the, the need to address the industrial emissions. And so um, I will tell you the first use, use of 45Q in North Dakota is not going to be by a coal-fired power plant. It's going to be an ethanol plant that has the flexibility to work. You know, we, we're, we're fortunate we are in proximity with the oil industry, so they're gonna capture the CO2 behind an ethanol plant. It's gonna be used in enhanced oil recovery, and that, in, that, that is gonna, in, in many ways, make their ethanol much more competitive into green markets of Oregon and California. And so don't think that it's not gonna be used by industrial plants. We'll find a way to do that in states like North Dakota that have an opportunity for either sequestration or utilization in the oil field. But I will tell you the single greatest thing that 45Q has done is put carbon capture, sequestration, and utilization on the climate map. People no longer, no longer doubt that we can do this. 
I was teasing uh, Brad, not really teasing. I should say it's real. We should do one like this that says it's real and each one of these projects that we're talking about and all this innovation, just be able to hand it out to the skeptics who say it's not real. It is real. And that education component is critical. I, the one thing I learned in Washington, D.C., and, and it's, uh, it's a throwback to opening up the oil export markets, um, lead with education. You know, we started with this idea, and when I said, I think that we can get it done in, in, in one year, in 2015, everybody laughed. They said, that can't happen. Only in Washington, if you come up with a good idea that no one has a logical argument against, do people say it should take five years to make a decision. Right? So, so we went to work, but we didn't go to work by introducing a bill and giving floor speeches. We started inviting people in. And the oil industry would sit down with anyone I told them to sit down with. That included Cory Booker, Brian Schatz, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, and they all got educated on what's happening with oil exports and what that means for the development of the oil industry and how we can displace oil from other less friendly sources. Um, Michelle Fortnoy, who um, probably would have been Secretary of Defense had Hillary won, came in and did testimony at the Banking Committee, um, well-known liberal, talking about how important it was to provide energy security. So we had every argument covered, but we did our homework beforehand. And so education is such a key component to this, and getting people to believe it's real. The last thing you want is Congress designing your needs, right? but you do want them to understand your needs, right? You do want them to understand how important it is. And, and then I would say clarity of the ask. This is a big document. You think you're gonna get it all? You think you could, yeah, good job. Eventually, right, eventually. Um, you know, we're engaged in a big debate right now in, in uh, politics. It's called the Green New Deal. And, you know, you can argue about whether that's um, vapor or whether that's real, whether that's well thought out in terms of policy. But one thing that you can't argue is that it, it, it has done a job in moving this issue to the forefront. And the question becomes, how does this issue fit within, how does a blueprint for carbon capture fit within the discussion on climate? How does agricultural um, credits fit within the discussion on climate? We all have an opportunity to have input in that discussion. And I think if we, if we sit back, simply criticize the Green New Deal, and not offer an alternative in terms of strategy, I think we will have missed this opening and this opportunity to really see a level of investment and bipartisanship. And the final thing I would say, how you get things done in Washington, is you build coalitions. Um, <laughs> I, when I was tax commissioner, I used to have this fight with John Dwyer, who was head of Lignite Research or, uh, Lignite uh, Council, and uh, which was the trade group for the Lignite industry in North Dakota. And we would argue every year, every legislative session about taxes, right? He'd always want them reduced, and I would go and argue as tax commissioner, you can't reduce them, they're paying a fair share, and we would get out charts, and we'd have the battle of the charts, and he never won. And I remember walking into a committee hearing, and I looked down, and I saw the railroad workers, I saw the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and I saw the trades, and I saw the utility unions, and I said, I'm done. I'm not gonna win this fight this time. Because he learned how to build a coalition that I couldn't fight. And so then we began negotiation. And so the one thing that this group has done is built an incredible coalition. There are brave environmental groups, and you should thank them, because this is not an easy, this is not an easy thing for them to engage in. But I think they understand that reasoned, reasonable public policy is critical to the development of, of um, the change that they need to prevent uh, climate catastrophe. And so they're looking for where is that spot where we can actually get things done. And so I would just say that the coalition is your greatest strength. The fact that every uh, idea of why, why are you here, is represented in this room with different ideas on what drives your participation. And there is an opportunity from all of this to look forward to actually getting something done 
in the next Congress. I don't think it's going to happen in this Congress. You might be able to get some tweaks to, to the extender package at the end. But the answer, the, the advice that I have for you is get ready. Get ready with what it is that you want to do and do not sit on the sidelines. You know, Vicki was very complimentary to me um, coming up here, but I'm going to throw it back at her. Do you know what would happen when we hit a snag on 45Q? I would pick up the phone and I would call Vicki, who she always took my call, and she, I would say, can you make these calls? And she would make the calls. That doesn't happen in Washington. You call people and say, well, you make the calls, yeah, yeah, when I get around to it. And that, what that means is I'm not going to waste my political capital on this. I'm not going to use whatever, you know, uh, uh, political uh, strength I have that's in my, my political bank to try and promote this. You have to be all in. And everybody has to be all in. You, some of you here represent states that haven't been as engaged you should get engaged with your delegations. You should get engaged with your governor. You should get engaged telling the story, telling the story of how this is the sweet spot, not just on climate, but on economic opportunity for the great country that we live in. And that if we let this pass by us, we will have missed an opportunity to realize a win-win for the American people. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions any of you have about how we did it. Um, what I see kind of um, into the future, um, what I think 2020 um, could, could bring in this discussion. Yeah, oh, yeah. Get down to business, man. Questions? Jim McDermott, I just want to say thank you. And uh, But I, my, my question is really around taxes and opening up the tax bill, right? So we had the 86 Tax Act, and we waited and waited and waited, and then we got, you know, the, the work under Trump. What do you think the likelihood is that you're going to get, or, well, the Senate or the House will get another crack at opening up, uh, you know, extensive tax legislation to go back in and make, you know, other than sort of tweaking the 45 and getting changes, What's the probability in your mind that we can actually get I, in? And I think it depends. I think that if 2020 brings you a, a Democratic House and a 50, if obviously if the president, you only need 50, if you have that circumstance, I think there will be a re, a, a reevaluation of the, of the tax bill. I think that um, that's what's being promised by the presidential candidates. That's what's going to be promised on the on the stump, and you know it's the one area where where um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, consternation among kind of the, the corporate uh, folks in terms of what would happen in 2020 if the Democratic Party took all three um, uh, critical uh, elements, that being the House, the Senate, and the, the presidency. Now, how extensive that modification will be, I don't think you're going to see a complete rollback of the corporate tax reductions. I think there was, there was a lot of interest in doing a reduction, just not down to 21 percent. I think there was a lot of interest in finding some permanency in tax credits, energy tax credits. One of the things, one of the opportunities when you look at extenders, that extender package, Remember that the Cadillac tax, we've kicked that down the road. We've kicked the medical device tax down the road. All of the Obamacare taxes that have never taken um, effect still remain on that list of things to do. And so I think there is an opportunity to do things with extenders um, uh, that, that will uh, stabilize, you know, whether it's with the IRS or whether it is finding a path forward for what constitutes actual sequestration of CO2. So there's more permanency in all of that. Um, maybe find some uh, additional ways to provide flexibility. Um, but but I, think, I, th I think that it's going to take finding someone in leadership. I mean, I, I will tell you honestly, oil ex the, the oil uh, export ban being lifted would not have happened if Kerry, Harry Reid had not cared about the ITCs. You know, Harry Reid, a huge, huge proponent historically of solar, saw a real opportunity to um, leverage 
um, the interest in opening up oil exports to get some permanency on solar tax credits. And so these are the kinds of deals that get cut behind the scenes, but you need somebody in leadership who's fighting for you. And the one thing that's happened since I've left the Senate is there really isn't a point of, of somebody who will go to the mat and call every person that they know to try and get it done. And, and that's the capacity that this group has to build that kind of um, uh, bipartisan, um, bicameral support for uh, some tweaks to begin with and then taking a look at a long-term plan. But to me, carbon capture, uh, uh, th this whole movement, we need to make sure that the public understands that this is an essential component to any kind of climate plan. Other questions? Thank you, Senator. Um, the Green New Deal and the organizations backing it seem flush with grassroots power. When you're talking about having a, um, some very influential business leaders make those phone calls, those, the coalitions in opposition can have tens of thousands of constituent phone calls and letter writing campaigns and rallies. My question is, do you think that the, I'm new to this coalition, but it seems to me pretty elite um, with leaders of business and industry, labor and conservation. Can you win against grassroots power with coalitions that lack it? Or do you think that we need to develop more grassroots capacity in this coalition? I, 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 what I, would, I mean, it's a great question. What, what I would tell you is that once we have an opportunity to present a climate plan that actually has some meat on the bones and includes this and you say, look, we care about climate, but here's a path forward for real change. You, you, you can't fight a movement with no counter idea. And I'm not saying that I oppose the Green New Deal. I don't even know what the hell it is. I mean, no, seriously, I, had, I was at Harvard um, doing a series of seminars with Gary Cohen this, um, this spring. And a young woman from Alaska came in, and she was, she was angry with me. She said, you're from a fossil-producing state, and you're all about, you know, blah, 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 and I believe in the Green New Deal, and, you know, pretty much just calling me out. And, and I kind of looked at her. I said, well, what is the Green New Deal? She goes, well, I said, no, 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 I know the aspiration, but what is the Green New Deal? I said, what, what, what's in there for conservation? Crickets. I said, what about nuclear? Are you, are you, I mean, zero carbon emissions. Uh, uh, do you see advanced nuclear as playing a role in meeting your climate goals? Crickets. I mean, I think, I think what we need to do is say, we believe you in terms of your aspirations. We believe this is a problem, but we believe this is a path forward to meeting the challenges. And I think there's enough people out there that are very, very interested in real, in stuff that's real, that it's not just people promising stuff to get elected, but people who can actually deliver once it is elected. And I think that's one thing, and I, I just have to correct you on one thing. I've spent time with labor unions. They aren't just labor leaders. That the, utility, the utility workers who I worked with on Keystone XL Pipeline, who I've worked with on a lot of these issues kind of going forward, the electric I mean, the brotherhood of electrical workers, the, the railroad workers. I mean, these are real people, and they vote. And, you know, one thing I would suggest to everybody who wants to go hardline on this, take a look at what happened in Australia, and take a look at the, uh, the, um, the evaluation of what happened in Australia, um, because a lot of people credit that with um, aspirational goals without... Uh, recognizing that those goals have real consequences for workers and real consequences for consumers. We can achieve the same result. And, and I, it, it's no surprise, I mean, I've been having this fight with almost anyone who will have the fight with me, um, it, that, that I'm standing here and saying that. But I want an opportunity to have that debate. And when I have that debate, I'm going to say, you know what, the development of this, that, that the person who has worked the hardest on climate policy in the United States Senate I can't speak for the House, has been Sheldon Whitehouse, and he's my co-sponsor. So what does that tell you about the importance of this policy towards a Green New Deal? One of the, what, 
think one of, one of the challenges is that um, the language has gotten away from us. Um, uh, and, and it's one discussion that I've been having with a lot of people here. What does it mean to be green? We have renewable fuel standards, right, for, uh, in many states. Guess what? Some of those states don't want to want to recognize hydroelectric. Not not green enough. Um, uh, you know they don't want to recognize that um, that nuclear can give you a carbon-free generation. A and so so we've got to have we've got to do a better job talking about clean energy and what that looks like and what what the path forward is. And we've got to support a lot of the um, groups that are I think. Le legitimate, and we've got to get out of out of the the binary room that we're in, right? You either believe climate's a problem, or you don't believe climate's a problem. If you believe climate's a problem, then this is what you need to think as a as an ideology. And what I'm saying is, if you believe climate's a problem, then you should be doing what we've been trying to do, which is find ways to address climate in 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 a in a way that will get actual passage. Because if you don't do that, if you don't do that, we, this isn't new. I, I'll never forget going to um, moderate a panel with um, the Lignite Research Council, the Mining Association was in. And I was supposed to be moderator among three people. And the woman who was representing the Mining Association said, um, no one cares about climate. And she said this 10 years ago. No one cares about climate. And you know, you're supposed to just say, no, can you explain to me why you think that, blah, blah, blah. And I went, are you kidding me? I said, that kind of thinking is going to be your end. That kind of thinking is going to be your end. And so everybody's got some stake in this. Everybody's got a reason to come to the table. We can find a path forward that will give us not only um, an opportunity to change the outcome that uh, we've been trying to um, achieve uh, on climate, but also have a discussion that recognizes that energy policy is a critical part of the economy of this country, and that we need to harmonize those two objectives in ways that actually will get a lot of public support. And if we do this through reconciliation, if the Green New Plan passes through reconciliation, guess what happens? It gets un undone the next time you lose an election. It is time we all get to the table as Americans and as citizens and solve this problem working together with the right solutions. So with that, I'll leave it. Thanks, you guys. And remember, it's the Tetons. It's the Tetons. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Senator. That was, that was terrific. So we um, uh, want to jump back now. We spent the morning talking about some of the other sectors. We want to jump back now into the power sector. Uh, for this part of our program, we're going to look at carbon capture and, broad, uh, and how it can be brought to existing power plants. Uh, we're familiar with the Petronova project, for example. And as it was talked about this morning during a couple of the panels with a number of coal plants uh, closing, and, and so, but some of the plants may be candidates for carbon capture retrofits as well. So. And as you've already heard a couple of times today, it's not just a coal issue, but it, uh, it's a gas issue uh, as well going forward. So this panel uh, will help us understand the issues that uh, are involved with, uh, with retrofits and going forward with existing plants. And very pleased that the moderator of this panel is John Brecky. Uh, John is the Vice President for Power Supply at Great River Energy. Uh, John uh, provides leadership for resource planning, energy markets, and power supply strategy. He's been a member of uh, Great River's executive team since 2005. Uh, John uh, had a chance to be able to work with him both on a number of, of projects and a lot of issues uh, in Minnesota. Uh, he always brings innovative ideas to the table. A uh, very thoughtful person who uh, really works on, on getting some things done, and I think that shows up in, in Great River's uh, uh, programs and, and policies. So we're really pleased that uh, that John is going to moderate the panel today, and he'll take, he'll take us the rest of the way. Thanks, John. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. 
We're looking forward to this panel discussion. And, and Great River Energy, we're proud members of the Carbon Capture Coalition. And hats off to Great Plains Institute for this event and, and their work in building the Carbon Capture Coalition. Something Senator Heitkamp said in her remarks was the importance of uh, developing coalitions and building groups that are, are of common purpose and common interest and can develop a mission together and how powerful that can be. Today's a great example of that with everyone assembled in this room working on carbon capture utilization and storage. So hats off to, to Great Plains and to all of you. The title of today's panel is Retooling Existing Power Plants, Opportunities and Challenges for Power Companies and Developing Carbon Capture Projects. I think this topic is so important to all of us who work in the electric utility industry. And we look forward to this conversation today. Carbon capture is a smart approach to preserve a diversified, reliable power supply portfolio for the electric grid. Today we're going to explore that. Up until now, most carbon emission reductions in the, car in the power supply sector have come from power plant retirements. And really, the easy ones have been done first. So can it all come from this in the long run? And even if it could, is that the right thing to do economically uh, for this country and for our power supply? Is that the most cost-effective way to reduce CO2 emissions, is simply to just retire coal plants out of existence? Or is there a better way? Is there a more economically efficient way for the long run? Well, the panelists uh, today are involved in the effort to find that other way. And I'm pleased to be a part of this conversation today. So as we explore this, we're mindful of the impact this can have in our country, in North America, and around the world. Perhaps there is no better way to curb greenhouse gas emissions than to cost effectively capture and safely store carbon dioxide at commercial scale in ways that can be spread to the world. So let's begin. Our first panelist today, I'm really happy to welcome uh, David Greeson. He's a consultant uh, on carbon capture and power generation projects. David was previously the vice president of development for NRG, where he led the Gulf Coast Business Development Group and the company's carbon capture program. David was the developer of the Petronova project, a $1 billion investment and he saw that from inception through commissioning. It's a landmark achievement in carbon capture and utilization in this country and uh, really forms the, the uh, beginning of dialogue for power companies around this country for carbon capture. He's now working on Minn Kota's Project Tundra and spending time in Grand Forks uh, with that. So please welcome David Greeson. Well, thanks everybody. And, uh, you know, when I started uh, Petronova back in 2009, I was kind of new to the industry. But now gathering here with, with you today, I see so many friends, so many people I've met along the way. Uh, it's really a, an honor to be here and, and be in front of you. I'm not exactly sure how this got up here. Uh, I am here as the developer of the Petronova project, but I'm not really here to talk about it. Be glad to answer any questions you have about it later, but I'm really here to talk about the project I'm working on now because in a lot of ways, Petronova is done. We have it in the bank. It's done a lot for the industry. It's, it's shown that amine systems can be built at scale, that you can come up with a commercial structure that makes carbon capture uh, benign to ratepayers for, uh, for the power plant. Uh, Petronova did not impact the cost of electricity off the power plant or what electric consumers in Texas pay. So it is possible to do this. Uh, we did get a, a DOE grant. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for, for your work on that. Um, DOE was a big partner. Uh, the, the Japanese oil company, uh, very forward thinking. Uh, JX, Nippon, was uh, a huge part of why we got that deal done. So I uh, want to thank everybody for that. But I'm really here to talk about the next exciting project for, for at least my uh, world in, in carbon capture, and that's Project Tundra. Uh, it's been around for a while. You've probably heard some of the things about it. But what really changed for Project Tundra, and the reason I'm working on it today, is 45Q changed everything for that project. You know, in, in North Dakota, there's many oil fields, but they're not as big as they are in Texas. There's not as uh, 
centralized an opportunity like the Permian Basin for enhanced soil recovery. The fields are smaller and, and more spread out. So the idea of aggregating enough fields to replicate the Petronova model was, was really challenging. And then 45Q came along. And with the, with the $50 per ton storage uh, incentive, tax incentive, it now looks like it's possible for us to build Project Tundra and do storage and do it in a way that will in, uh, incite investment or, or induce investment into the project. Um, one of the things that uh, I presented on many times for the Petronova project was that our fence line cost of CO2 was around $61, $62 per ton. And uh, you know, I made, in 2017, I made 23 different presentations at conferences like this and made mention of that. Well, today I can tell you after a number of uh, pre-feed study work done on Project Tundra and looking at the commercial structure and the storage opportunities that are right adjacent to the plant, we think for at least Project Tundra, the 45Q incentive that's available now will get the project built. That will allow us to unlock this uh, EOR opportunity in North Dakota because we don't have to have one field, one operator, or, or aggregate one set of uh, fields and operators to take EOR from the start. Now we can set this up as a storage project, a, a capture and storage project with a, uh, with a pipe that says, you know, if Oxy, if you guys want to come to North Dakota, uh, pick your CF2, CO2 up right here and it's going to be really cheap because if you don't need all of it, we'll take care of it with the storage facility. So uh, Tundra itself is a 450 megawatt capture system. It's, um, that's roughly twice the size of Petronova, so it'll be the largest post-combustion capture system uh, if we can get it done. We're hoping to be under construction by late 2022. The long pole in the tent for that schedule is licensing the storage facility. You know, by the time you characterize, I mean, uh, the guys in Illinois know this too well. Scott, I don't know if you're still in the room, but, you know, getting the MRV plan, getting all that stuff together, uh, getting everything characterized just to file an application is going to take over a year. So um, the air permits, all the other permits and licenses that we need to, to operate the facility can easily be done in nine to 12 months. So we're starting this summer on characterizing the, the storage facility, and then later this year, we'll start on licensing the rest of the facility. Um, Capture-wise, uh, it's about three and a half million tons per year, so that's um, it's gonna be a lot of CO2. One of the things that makes this plant a little unique, unlike most of the coal plants in the US facing a lot of pressure from uh, shale gas and, and from renewables, uh, this plant runs, last year it ran at 92% capacity factor. It runs round the clock. So in this case, we're able to size the capture system to match the size of the power plant. In Petronova, we were dealing with a power plant that, that cycled every day, every night. And so we only built the capture system large enough to, to capture the base loaded round the clock portion of the generation out of that unit. So we're excited about it. My uh, my client, Minkota, is, is really excited. We've got, uh, we're building our team and we should be fully underway uh, with licensing by, by late this year. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was an excellent summary of a great project that is inspiring. Our next panelist is Mr. Don Gaston. He's the president and CEO of Prairie State Generating Company. The campus provides a very important part of Illinois' power supply. Mr. Gaston has an extensive professional background in fossil generation, safety programs, environmental control technology, and improving power plant reliability. Prior to joining Prairie State, he served as director of fossil generation for the Public Service Enterprise Group, which is one of the largest uh, electric companies in the U.S., and it's New Jersey's oldest and largest publicly owned utility. Don earned a Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and an MBA from the University of Tennessee. And he's now enrolled in uh, solving carbon challenges for Prairie State and its member owners. Um, please welcome Don Gaston.
Thank you, and uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I want to do four things in my few minutes that I have here. Um, the first is um, I want to tell you who Prairie State is, and I want to tell you why we are interested in carbon capture. And then I want to talk about the top three obstacles to building a capture plant and the top three opportunities. Uh, Prairie State is located in southern Illinois. Um, this is a, kind of a dim but sexy picture of our power plant. <laughs> uh, in, in my view, the only thing sexier than this view would be if I could tell you that Prairie State was a carbon neutral power plant. And one of the things I, I don't think many people realize is that the technology exists today to make carbon or a coal-fired power plant carbon neutral. You can capture 95% of the CO2, and then you can market your fly ash and byproducts and use that for concrete and offset the CO2 in the concrete industry. So essentially, you could have a carbon neutral power plant. So it's te technically possible, but it's not economic. And um, uh, the economic challenges are, are what we're investigating right now. Uh, but first, a little bit about Prairie State. Uh, Prairie State is 100% owned by public power entities, uh, rural cooperatives, and municipalities. Uh, there's 2.5 million families across the Midwest that are served by Prairie State, uh, most of them in rural communities. Uh, only 40% of our electricity is used in the state of Illinois. The rest is spread throughout eight other states uh, across the Midwest. The power plant was built in 19, uh, excuse me, was built in 2012 and, and went commercial in 2012. It's the largest coal-fired power plant built in the United States since 1982. And, uh, uh, you know, came online during the Obama administration and has some of the toughest environmental regulations of any coal-fired power plant in the world. Um, our power plant has over one billion dollars in state-of-the-art emission controls. Uh, uh, it has uh, technologies that make it far more efficient than any other power plant in Illinois by a wide margin. We're 15% more efficient than the second best plant in Illinois and one of the most efficient in the United States. Uh, and that efficiency is important because it means that we can produce more megawatts with less CO2. The, uh, while we're considering carbon capture, I, I said that our, the 2.5 million families that invested in Prairie State uh, borrowed $5 billion to do that in 2012. They've essentially got a mortgage that runs out to 2042 that they need to pay off. So our power plant needs to operate at full load, base load, until 2042. Uh, the hundreds of people whose jobs are supported by Prairie State depend on that. The businesses and the uh, schools and the districts that we serve are very dependent on the tax revenues. and. Um, the success of Prairie State is incredibly important to the Southern Illinois economy. Our vision at Prairie State is to be the best coal mine and coal-fired power plant in the country. And when I say the best, that means we want the highest safety standards and we want the highest environmental standards. My expectation is that Prairie State will be a role model for other power plants, not only in the United States, but around the world, to how as to how to burn coal responsibly from both a safety and environmental perspective. So that's why we're considering, uh, or one reason why we're considering carbon capture. The second reason that we're considering carbon capture is that we just believe it's the right thing to do. Um, we're, we've spent the past year and we'll spend another year, year and a half, uh, exploring uh, carbon capture opportunities. Uh, we'll be um, uh, uh, working with the Department of Energy. I'm hopeful that Prairie State will be selected for a feed study uh, in August that would um, uh, do a front-end engineering design for a CO2 capture system. If selected, uh, Prairie State would be uh, the largest in the world. Uh, we're a, you know, each unit is 816 megawatts. 
Uh, so we're four or five times larger than the Petronova site, where, you know, which is the, the largest in the world today. The obstacles to getting a carbon capture system built at Prairie State are, are high, and I, I don't want to uh, sugarcoat these. The first is just the cost of installation and operation. Uh, to build a CO2 capture facility, uh, we're talking about a billion dollars or more in investment. Uh, coming up with that kind of money is challenging. Uh, uh, our owners, because we're a nonprofit entity and because of the way the plant was financed with municipal bonds and, and other types of bonds, uh, they're not eligible for the tax credits. So um, it's likely to build a capture facility at Prairie State, it's going to take third party investors. Um, we are working with some. Uh, there are investors that are willing to invest in a capture system at Prairie State if we can guarantee a 6% return. Making that guarantee is, is challenging. So the cost of the installation is the first challenge. The second is the difficulty of proving that CO2 capture will work at the scale we're talking about. You know, it's a big leap from a 250 megawatt capture facility like they have at Petronova to an 816 megawatt uh, unit at Prairie State. Um, and that, that provides some investment risk, which is the third concern. While 45Q is great, um, I, those tax credits are only available for 12 years, and they start you know, in 2024, I believe. Uh, the problem with that in the state of Illinois is that there's also legislation that has been introduced in our state legislature that says uh, all, re all fossil fuels will go away by 2030. And that's been a component of the Green New Deal. So if you're an investor and you're counting on those 45Q tax credits, and there's a possibility that your fossil plant's gonna go away five or six years into that investment, you know, you're probably gonna put your money somewhere else. So the regulatory uncertainty is a major barrier uh, that, that has to be overcome. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for us for building a carbon capture facility at Prairie State. Uh, first of all, um, our country, I believe, is the only country in the world that has the innovation to design and develop carbon capture systems that can be used worldwide uh, 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 and, and we can be a leader in that. Um, there are, and for people who want to shut down all fossil generation in the United States, if you shut down every single coal plant in the United States today, in less than four years, China and India and the rest of the world would already have made up that difference. So the coal plants are going to be built in the rest of the world, whether we like it or not. It's going to be us that develops the technologies and has the innovation to be able to responsibly capture that CO2, and we can market those technologies worldwide. And I believe the United States could be the leader in doing that. The second opportunity is that baseload energy is still needed. Um, renewables are very important, and I have no doubt, and I support the growth of renewables. Uh, but the wind doesn't always blow and the su sun doesn't always shine. There has to be a baseload backup. A lot of people think that nuclear can supply that backup. The problem is most nuclear plants in the United States do not cycle. They can only run at one load, and that's for safety considerations. So they, they can't cycle to manage the load demand as it changes through the day. So there's got to be some other backup uh, power supply to be able to meet that changing demand throughout the day. So grid stability is, an, in my view, an incredibly important reason that plants like Prairie State are important long term in the United States. Um, the third big opportunity 
is one of the most important. Um, coal is a incredibly important commodity to many rural Midwestern towns and communities. Many of the jobs depend on coal or the power plant or the materials and supplies and wages of those power plant workers. Um, in my view, it makes a lot more sense for us to invest in existing facilities like Prairie State uh, to have them last long term than it would be to start, you know, to scrap Prairie State and invest in new technologies that haven't been proven. So with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, Brad and the others for inviting me to speak today. Um, the, the last point I'd like to make, I think this roadmap um, is awesome. Uh, it's an incredible document that uh, has been developed and uh, I just applaud everyone in here who's worked on this. Uh, th this uh, it's gonna take bipart bipartisan solutions to solve the CO2 issue in the United States. And this is a great, great start. So thank you very much. Thank you, Don. That was just excellent and a very well-structured list of barriers and opportunities that we face as we look at power sector transformation on CO2 capture. Very well done. We're also very pleased to have with us today Kathy Woolhams. Kathy is the Senior Vice President and Chief S Sustainability Officer for Berkshire Hathaway Energy. She's responsible for the development and implementation of the company's worldwide corporate sustainability program. She serves as the co-chair of Berkshire Hathaway Sustainability Leadership Council. Ms. Willems received her BA in political science from Winona State University and her JD from Drake Law School in Iowa. She previously served as law clerk to, the, to a judge in the Seventh Judicial District of Iowa and was a litigation attorney in private practice. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Willems. I do have a slide, hopefully, yes. Um, pictures tell a, a lot of words, um, and, and I think this, this one is um, probably the sum and substance of what I want to talk to you about today. Um, unlike Don's challenges, um, I think our challenges are a little bit different, um, regulatorily driven, uh, but certainly um, relatively significant uh, in the grand scheme of things. So I want to just take you through um, what Berkshire Hathaway Energy looks like uh, so you can get a sense of, of what some of those challenges are. Um, you know, I work for an organization actually that only has about 30 employees. So Berkshire Hathaway Energy itself has about 30, uh, regardless of the fact that we've got, you know, 11.8 million customers. Um, consistent with, I think, the overall Berkshire philosophy um, we're very lean uh, in the holding company organizational structure. And so, um, you know, here I am. Uh, <laughs> you know, you got a big chunk of us today. Um, <laughs> but um, our operating companies are where things really happen. Uh, we, as the holding company, have established six core principles that we expect our um, operating companies to, to carry out in a variety of ways based on their um, local situations uh, because they, they really are locally managed. But those um, core principles are customer service, operational excellence, environmental respect, uh, regulatory integrity, uh, yeah, um, employee commitment, and financial <coughs> strength. And so, you know, all of the businesses, all of the operating companies will develop goals based on those six core principles uh, to deliver what we expect to be not only exceptional service to customers, but consistent with um, the overall company vision uh, and, and mission. So if we kind of start with um, the, the regulated utilities, I'm based in Iowa. Um, my service provider is Mid-American Energy Company. Uh, has made a very strong play on the renewable front. Uh, by the time WIND 12, uh, which is the 12th tranche of WIND projects, 
uh, is fully complete. We'll have about 6,000 megawatts of wind generation in the state of Iowa, which basically allows us to match on an annual basis customers' consumption uh, with the amount of wind generation uh, that we produce. Being part of the mid-continent independent system operator, fundamentally that serves as our, our battery storage, if you will, uh, because we also have uh, coal plants that um, bid into that market and are routinely called upon uh, to provide service uh, in a cost-effective manner. Uh, so, you know, moving kind of to the west from a, an electric utility perspective, we've got NV Energy, um, wholly owned, uh, located in Nevada, serves about 90% of the load, uh, electric load in the state of Nevada, uh, but really has undergone some pretty significant um, challenges over the past several years uh, where there was a ballot initiative to actually change the way um, customers uh, utilize their electricity so that it, it was called the customer choice initiative and um, it would have allowed a lot more competition and basically pushed us out of the way. There's already some existing state mechanisms for uh, certain size customers to go off the system. So uh, the first ballot initiative was such that, and it had to go through um, two different uh, sessions of the legislature. Uh, it was a constitutional amendment, which was um, an interesting mechanism to utilize in that circumstance. But um, the first vote on that initiative was about 75% of customers voting for choice. And of course, if we, if, it, if we asked anybody in this room today, you know, are you in favor of choice or not, everybody's going to say, yes, I like to have choices because I like to choose whether to eat chicken or fish for dinner. Um, it's, it's how the question is framed, and it wasn't framed particularly well the first go around. Uh, so we literally had to battle um, very significantly in the sec second ballot initiative to get the question framed the right way, um, to make sure that customers understood what it was that they were voting for, um, and then ultimately defeated the second ballot initiative. One would think then that we're in safe territory, but every day we see um, additional customers contemplating going off our system. And what happens in that circumstance, of course, is the fact that you push or condense costs onto your remaining set of customers. And those are typically residential customers who you know, don't have the wherewithal, for example, to contract separately for um, their generation supplies or to do 100% renewable through their own procurement processes, et cetera. So that was a very significant concern um, from a customer standpoint in wanting to make sure that we remain cost competitive and don't unduly burden those oftentimes who are, are least able to um, pay for the cost of their electricity. If we moved west then, um, and, and this is uh, a a pretty challenging issue at times, but um, Pacific Corp, which does business in six western states, uh, as Rocky Mountain Power in Wyoming, Utah, and Idaho, and as Pacific Power in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, that system operates through the six states. All the resources go in. There's an allocation formula that all the states have sort of agreed to, uh, but it's probably no surprise to anybody that the um, states of California, Oregon, and Washington have a fundamentally different philosophy relative to the type of generation they want to serve their state.